Hello and welcome to the Draft to Digital Spotlight. My name is Mars Mark. My my I don't have a name. Name apparently I haven't had enough coffee today. But when I do have coffee, my name is Mark Leslie Lefave. Wow, that's a mouthful to get out. But I am honored and excited to have in studio with me today, Alessandra Tori. Alessandra, welcome. Thank you. It's great to have you. Here. And you're not gonna you're great not to gonna you trip here. over your tongue the way I have already have. I already did. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. So multi-time New York Times best-selling author, so many accomplishments behind you. When did it all start for you as a writer? Well, it all started for me in 2012. I was not one of these people who dreamed about being a writer. That was never something I thought was a possibility. Uh, I was a reader and I loved to read. But in 2012, self-publishing was like really starting to rock and roll. And E.L. James was just killing it, you know, and uh, and I lost my job um, and was just trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, like what I really wanted to do with my life, you know, and um, and I had a summer ahead of me and I thought, you know, I'll I'll just write a book. I'll, I'll try this. My mom was writing a book and she was telling me all about the process. And so I sat down and I wrote uh, Blindfolded Innocence, which was a novel. And um, and it was pretty slow. Like, I mean, I had five to 10 sales a day, which I was super excited about. Um, but then three months after it took off and then um, I got an agent and a publisher and um, signed a big publishing deal. And that was really the start of everything. But since then I've written 23 novels. I've hit the New York Times with seven times, all with self-published books. My self-published books have been my successes, not my traditionally published books. So I'm a huge advocate for self-publishing. Yeah, and, and, and we're going to be getting into all the amazing things you do to help other writers as well. But I do want to ask you, because I know writers are curious about that, what's the sure. difference between uh, when you're working with traditional publishers and when you're self-publishing? How do you, do you approach the projects differently? How does that, uh, how does that usually go for you? Yeah, so I've been, um, I have three different traditional publishers, Hachette, Harlequin, and Amazon with Thomas and Mercer. And every process has been different. Um, the hardest thing when you're dealing with a traditional publisher is the loss of control. You know, I mean, it's not you're really your baby anymore. Um, every publisher I've worked with has been amazing as far as the content inside the book. Um, if I have stuck to my guns on something that I didn't want to change, they have yielded. Everything has kind of been like a, if you agree, then, you know, this is a suggestion that we think. Um, so that's been great. And the editorial process has taught me so much. I've really grown as a writer um, through using tr those traditional editors. But the marketing is completely out of your control. The packaging, the pricing, the distribution is completely out of your control. And that's really hard for me as a self-published author because uh, I've learned I'm a control freak. So uh, so there's that. And also, like with right now, I'm working on my second book with Thomas and Mercer, and they want to know what the book's about, you know, before I write it, which <laughs> makes perfect sense. Um, but I'm a pantser. And so um, the book that I am halfway through writing is very different from what I told them it was going to be about. But uh, but I really love it. And I think they're really going to love it. So I'm going to I'm going to have to be springing that on them pretty soon. Oh, that's hilarious. Now, you talked a little bit about marketing. So uh, the marketing with the traditional publisher is mostly in their hands. And then when you're doing your own work, that, is that you doing it? Or uh, do you work with other people? How do you approach the, the marketing when you're in control? We brought, so at, early on in my career, really for the first three years, I used a publicist, um, a book publicist. Not I've used all, I've used every, I've spent more money on on things than than anyone I know, but I have hired famous publicists. Um, I've hired traditional publicists, um, and then I've hired and had the most success really with just indie book publishers, which are more like blog connectors and influencers that can um, can get me exposure on blogs. Um, but I took all of my marketing in house probably about three years ago. I have an assistant. Um, so, and I'd always worked on maintaining my own relationship with bloggers and reviewers. So even when I used a publicity company, I always wanted to be the one to, to reach out individually to those blogs and be their point of contact. So, um, I've just developed my own contacts that we do our own launches and our own releases. And, um, 
and unfortunately, I'm a one-stop shop in terms of I'm, I do my own advertising and things like that. I need to bring in more people to my team. Um, I know that. Uh, I just, it's the loss of control, man. You know, it's, <laughs> I, I just like, I like doing things myself. Oh, wow. That, that, does that f slow you down from the writing then because you're doing all of those uh, extra elements? Yes, but really, I moved two or three years ago into um, online courses for authors and a conference and things like that. So to be honest, my writing has suffered because of that. Like, I just don't have enough time. I used to write four books a year. Now I'm down to two. So, um, and, and my marketing of my own books has suffered. Um, it's one of those things, you know, like I can only take 10 steps a day. And if I was just writing books, then I could take 10 steps towards writing and promoting and marketing those books a day. But right now I'm taking three steps here and two steps here and two steps on my conference. And so a lot of times my books only get one step a day, you know? Um, so as a result, sales suffer. I mean, that's just the way it is. I'm, I'm really excited to get to all of the cool stuff that you do for writers. Uh, we are participating in uh, Inker's Con, which is an amazing, yeah. people don't can't say enough great things about the content you guys produce from that conference. And obviously you were already partially digital <laughs> as well. So you already had great digital resources. So yeah. you're already prepared for this year. But uh, before I get into that, I, I want to talk. So you, you've achieved things that most authors just lie awake at night dreaming of. I mean, you know, seven times New York's time, New York Times bestseller, not just one. But then you also had a book turned into a movie. You, how did Hollywood Dirt, how did that whole thing happen? Sure. So Hollywood Dirt, this is Hollywood Dirt. It's a, um, it's a romance about a movie that comes to a small town. And that, um, that came about in 2014, I want to say. I just got an email one day um, from... Tosca Musk, she's Elon Musk's sister. Um, and she said, uh, me and two other women have started a production company called Passion Flicks. We'd love our first movie to be Hollywood Dirt. And I had been through the ring. I've, I've been dealing with Hollywood for a long time. Um, the Girl in 60 was an erotic thriller that we spent three years and got a big studio deal on that fell apart. And The Ghost Rider, I, I just, at that point, Anyone who reached out to me from Hollywood, with, I just was completely uninterested. But I, but I'm, I'll take phone calls with anybody. You know, if if, if someone reaches out to me, it, I'll take a phone call with anybody. So I said, sure. Like, let's get on the phone. And uh, we had a great call where they said um, our focus is really on making the books exact or making the movies exactly like the books. And that was very different from my Girl in Sixty experience, which was a, just a complete 180 from the book. And um, and I said, okay, that sounds great. And they said, well, Senior kind of I said, that sounds great. And then a couple months later, they reached out to me with casting. And I will tell you, I did not believe that that movie was going to happen until I was standing in a Dunkin' Donuts factory, freezing my butt off in the middle of Georgia, and cameras were around me, and things, you know, lights came on, they start rolling. And I'm like, whoa, like, wait a minute, this movie's actually happening. <laughs> but I did not believe it. I read the script, I edited the script, I said, yeah, they they were great. They kept me involved. What one thing I wanted was to learn. I really wanted to learn the process. And from everything from um, the set design to the animals we use to the um, to the music that they used to score the film. I was involved in every single aspect of it and it was great, but yeah, but I, I, I didn't believe it until it happened um, because it, it, there are gonna be times where you're reached out to normally by producers. Producers are normally the ones who find a project and then they put together a package where they bring in a script screenwriter and they bring in talent actresses or actors and a studio. And um, it's really exciting to get really excited about it and to announce it to your fans and to scream that you're gonna have a movie but gosh it's so rarely do those things ever come about and if they do for me my mindset is this book is my perfect representation of the book their movie is their baby you know and you just yeah. gotta you gotta release control 
Wow. So I have to ask because this sometimes happens because you were there on set at least for part of it. Do, do you make a cameo in the movie? I do. Yeah. Ooh, see, <laughs> yeah. Now, now I want to watch it even more. I saw the trailer. The first scene to be in. I'm in a church scene that has like, um, we probably had a hundred extras. And for that three minutes, of footage is less than that. It's like a minute and a half. It was nine hours, and my stepson is sitting next to me, and the, he's also in the movie. And uh, at, at, like at that point, at the end of that, he's like, "I don't want to be an actor because you like we were having to film it over and over from different camera angles where the camera wasn't seeing the shot." And oh my gosh, it was the longest thing I've ever done. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I I do not have talent as an actress. We decided that <laughs> during the filming. <laughs> so if you think waiting for the book to get turned into a movie takes a long time, just just imagine that one scene. I uh, in 1999, I was in an AOL Canada commercial, and uh -huh. it was one of those testimonial commercial things. I think sure. we were on set for 16 hours. And, uh -huh. and all, and I was only interviewed by the director for about an hour and a half to get a 15 second soundbite clip and video. Uh -huh. that was it. And it was kind of like the longest day. Now it was, I was getting paid as a, as an actor. So it was, it was awesome. But I was thinking, wow, there's a lot of waiting around. You could write a book while you're waiting on set. <laughs> you could, and they are long days. I was there as much as I could. It took a month to film, five weeks to film. I was there for three weeks of that probably. And let me tell you what, they're 12, 13 hour days. Yeah. And then the actors go back and then they practice their lines and meet with each other. And then they're, I mean, they're working for another four hours in the hotel room and then they're repeating it all the next day. Um, and they were troopers. We filmed, it was winter in Georgia and the um, factory that we were filming in, the, the heat was too loud. Like the heater was too loud. So we had to have the entire uh, heat system yeah. turned off. So we were freezing, like they were sucking on ice cubes so that their breath wouldn't fog up when they oh, spoke. Oh, wow. And, and she's wearing- <laughs> That's like a thing. Like yeah, she's wearing something like this. And there was a space heater we would turn on as soon as the camera stopped to, to like warm them up. It was crazy. Oh, that well, actually I have to share because when I was doing the AOL uh, commercial, we were in a shed on a farm uh, north of Toronto, Ontario in November, early November. And everyone on set was huddled in winter jackets. And yes. I had to be sitting there pretending I was in my writing space, this fake writing space, just with a, a light vest on. And, and it, again, it was just freezing. So between takes, they'd throw a jacket on me and it will oh, warm up. <laughs> it's like a seat, like, you know, like the minute it stops, someone's there with like, yeah, big. Yeah, yeah, like exactly. at the end of a marathon, right? Where they throw the, the sheet yeah. on you to warm you. <laughs> so I, uh, there's so many things you do to, to, to help writers. Um, and maybe maybe I want to talk about Anchors Con. I want to talk about, uh, I know you've got the five keys. I'd love to talk about that. And then there, there, there's more. It, where, what's a good place to start? What do you think? Um, let's start with five keys. Okay, success. cool. So I kind of knock, knock on a lot of different things there. So um, when... Mark and I chatted about me coming on. Um, I first wanted to say like five mistakes authors made. Then I was like, you know, let me talk instead a little more positively. So um, five keys to a successful author career. So that's what I just want to whip through real quick things I've learned in the past eight years. Everyone um, get your pens out now. Yeah, grab your pen, there's gonna be a quiz at the end. <laughs> no, um, so the first is like defining success. So it's five keys to a successful author career. And the first thing to do is really to define success in a positive way. So I always think back to when I published my first book and I was ecstatic over 10 sales a day. I mean, that like, I mean, I was just like on cloud nine. And I remember pulling out my calculator then and saying, Okay, if I write 10 books and I'll have 100 sales a day, you know, then I'll be making $250 a day. Like, I don't have to go back to work. Like, I could just write full time and have, what an amazing job that would be, right? So, um, and I had kind of done this plan, like, how long would it take me to write 10 books and, and what would that look like? So, um, so it's important that you define success, whatever that is. And for a lot of people, their idea of success is writing full time. Let me tell you what, writing full-time is not all that it's cracked up to be. 
because the minute that that next book release is responsible for paying your mortgage, and if that book release doesn't go as you expect it to be, then you're going to be in a really tight financial situation. That completely changes your creative dynamic. It changes your stress level. It makes this entire job not fun. Um, so don't rush to try to write full time. Um, it's great to write full time. It's a wonderful job, but take your time. Only move into that if you are willing to have moments where you have six months where you have a complete drop in sales and it's not going to affect your stress level whatsoever. You know, or um, you know, or a lot of people say a six month of earnings in the bank. So that no matter what happens, you have a, you have a cushion. Um, but appreciate the little things. Celebrate, you know, five star reviews when they come. Um, don't compare yourself to others. The biggest uh, thief of happiness is comparison. So um, that in this industry will really hurt you. So um, focus on your success and what that success is to you, and and give yourself attainable. Um, goal mark so that you're not disappointed and you're not, you know, harder on yourself than you need to be. The fact that you've written a book in, or that you're about to write a book is a huge accomplishment in itself. That let me tell you what I work with aspiring authors every single day. It's a huge accomplishment and so one that one out of ten people that start to write a book never finish. So that in itself. Um, second key to success: um, the value of editing. So. Editing is one thing that I'll tell, I'll, I'm as guilty of it as anyone. My very first book, I wrote it, I read it three times, caught what I thought was a ton of typos, right? And I was like, this thing's good to go, right? Like <laughs> published, done, sit back and count my money. Um, and, and that is something a lot of new authors really skimp and scrimp on is editing. But having a strong editor and, um, and having a strong editorial process is really important. And if you are on a budget, it doesn't mean that your book has to be neglected. There are ways around, even if you don't have $1,000 to hire an editor, you know, invest, first of all, in beta readers. Um, I spoke, I interviewed A.G. Riddle for InkersCon, and he uses beta readers. Do you want to take a guess how many beta readers he uses, Mark? Uh, I'm, I'm going to say 30. 150. No. I was thinking 30 was a lot. I thought for, if he said 30, I would have fallen out of my chair. He said 150, <laughs> and I about kicked my job off the floor. For every book. I, they're not like specialists? Like there's there's a group here and a group there? No, it's all, wow. Yeah, yeah. He's 150 days off. So, so let me tell you what. there, And it's not because he doesn't have the money to spend on editors. He also has editors, but he really values beta feedback and beta feedback can be really powerful if you have strong betas. So if you are an author on a budget, use beta readers, use the, the digital editors that are out there. By digital editors, like I'm biased, Authors AI is um, a company that I work with, a tech startup. We are able to analyze a complete manuscript and give um, tips on that manuscript. It's basically a developmental editor, automated and quick, but without the human touch, and for less than thirty dollars a month. So that's my plug for Authors AI. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But but there are great ways that you can edit your manuscript, even if you don't have the money to hire an editor. So something is better than nothing. But save your pennies, invest in editing, whether it's digital or live. Um, and um, because that's really important and that you cannot be successful if you do not have a strong product. That's just the okay. bottom line. You can have a one hit wonder, but you're not going to build long term. Career. Um, and third, focus on craft. Um, I will tell you, I'm as guilty as anyone. I attended author conferences and there's all these like craft classes, right? And I just like flip through those pages <laughs> and I get to the marketing classes and I'm like, that's what I'm going to. And, and it took me years. It wasn't until I started teaching people how to write that I was like, you know what? I need to really know what I'm talking about. And I need to know not just my process, but how other authors work. And I really started diving into craft. And my writing skill improved so much as a result. So for every hour you spend on marketing, you need to spend at least half of that on craft. If it's reading great books, if it's learning how to write, if it's watching 
you know, interviews like this. YouTube is a great place. At authors.ai, we have author resources that we're adding to all the time. There's a ton of free resources, but yeah, just, um, or if it's rewriting your own work, just work on your craft and never stop because you never know everything. It's just, you get better with every single book you write. Um, fourth, develop your team. Um, my team is a support system of authors. It's my editors and proofreaders, which just take time to find and build. But other authors and my family are a support system I could not function without. And you can find authors, best place to find is conferences. You know as well as anyone, Mark, like a face-to-face, -face, and we were talking about this like with Ingrid's Con, right? Like how do you create those um, relationships online? But I say that in my five closest author friends, I might have met them once or twice ever. You know, all of our communication is done online. So especially now with COVID and everything else, like we're finding more ways to connect online and network. And those author resources are invaluable. You wanna have open communication. You wanna be honest about what's working for you and what doesn't, what you're struggling with in your writing and what you're not. Because let me tell you what, you don't have to waste ten thousand dollars on a special ad opportunity you can have someone else waste it and then tell you how it worked and then you can make that decision for yourself you know like there's there's a lot we can all grow and improve from both things that work for us and things that don't and then the last key of success is just pay attention to your packaging and genre um this was another thing like until i started teaching classes and I was like really I just learned about genre recently like I've always been like oh I know my genre right like I write romantic suspense or whatever and for we didn't really type on that but I write romance um, suspense and contemporary fiction um, but you if you really dive into first of all hone down to what your subgenre is um, and as specifically as possible and then really study that genre in terms of packaging Covers, pricing, descriptions, or descriptions written, and you know of, of the best sellers. If you look at the best sellers, that's who you need to learn from. Um, are they written first person or third person? You know, what's the average length of books in that genre? And then, what are like obligatory scenes in that genre? What is your reader expecting? Because when I wrote my first romance novel, I did not read romance. I just that was the book that came out of me, and. Because I didn't read romance, I didn't know what those readers expected. So I was having my hero, my main male character, doing stuff that no romance hero should be doing, you know. But I didn't know, I because I didn't know my, I did not know my genre. You need to read bestsellers in your genre and learn from them. And that um, Marlo, what our technology at Authors AI is focused on is that our technology read bestsellers, New York Times bestsellers across multiple genres and found the commonalities in those books and then um and then helps you look at your own book and how your different um aspects of that book match the best sellers and how you can make your book more you know um to where what readers are looking for because whether readers know it or not they have expectations and they don't know what those expectations are but you, you can find those expectations through reading books like the bestseller code or um researching genre norms um they don't know those expectations but when you don't meet them they tell you like they tell you in negative reviews or by not buying your next book oh wow and and so the author's ai i'm i'm curious about that because when when i was reading about it i learned that it uh there was this book the bestseller code that as a bookseller i had to read it immediately when it came out and uh isn't uh, one or, or more of the people behind the technology that created that bestseller code it, uh, involved in Authors AI? Yeah, so the bestseller code was written by Matt Jockers and Jody Archer. They're the co-authors. Matt Jockers um, is one of our founders. So he took all of his AI and the, that technology and that knowledge and brought it to us. And basically it took what that book was about, and it's really cool what they did, is they were able to give the technology a manuscript, not tell that technology anything about that manuscript and say, here is the client, but they didn't tell it that it was the client, right? It was like, here's the client. Is this book, was this book a bestseller? And the technology would read the book in 
you know, a minute and a half. They'd read the book and it would say, yes, this book was a bestseller or no, it was not. And 83% of the time when it said, yes, this book was a bestseller or no, it wasn't, it was correct. And that was strictly based off the manuscript. So there are certain key elements in your manuscript that will affect whether it is now, granted, there's a lot of other things, right? Marketing questions, stuff like that. But what's cool about this technology is you can decide what books, like if I was a publisher using this technology, I could say, okay, what books do we want to put a million dollars of marketing power behind? Right. You know, um, and it can read it, it. This technology can read the book and say, this has all of the earmarks of a bestseller, of a book that can become a bestseller, or it doesn't. And this is why it doesn't. You know, this is where it's failing. Right, or this is where it doesn't line up with expectations in that genre, et cetera. And, and I love that because whether it's an author doing it themselves or whether it's a publisher wanting to do it, they can they can actually decide, okay, my next this next release, how much am I going to invest into it? Well, depending on how it lines up, it has the chances of being a bestseller based on the, what is it, the the it, it has that je ne sais quoi that the, that the computer finds yeah, in there. Which is a combination of plot pacing character development i mean there's so many things like that Mar marlo is what we call our technology there's so many things marlo looks at but i've i've run it i've run it on my worst sellers and i've run it on my best sellers um i find it fascinating so i run it on and then now i run it on my first draft before i send it to the editor and then um and then i run it on my sequent drafts so that I can see and I can see improvement with each one and that's exciting um, to me. Is this so I'm curious as a writer is this something that I could use before I give it to my developmental editor who normally does a substantive edit and line it and, and, and a really deep dive maybe because that could save me money because if I get charged by the hour by my editor. You can put it as clean as possible. I yeah. suggest I suggest you run it early. Like a lot of people run it when they're like halfway through the book. Really, you can run it halfway through the book, but really it works best when it can see the full plot arc. Right. Um, so if, and the plans, it's cheap to run a report. It, it's not an expensive thing. So right. yeah, I agree with you. If I could cut off one round of editing, that would be huge, both for my time and for my editors and for my pocketbook. But um, I suggest running it like yeah, first draft before you send it to a developmental editor, and then I like running it once it's more polished. And when I think it's pretty good, like when I'm normally going to just send it out to my final betas to make sure I'm not doing anything, you know, crazy in it that you know everybody. <laughs> so, is there uh, is, is you're talking about novels? Uh, is there is there novella length? So what is the? I mean, where does it cut off? If I had something that was about twenty two thousand words, or maybe even fifteen thousand words, that's shorter. Is it going to work with something like that as well, or is it optimized? Yeah, we normally say 20,000 words. That mm -hmm. being said, um, we've run a 12,000 word manuscript through, and it did fine. But the more it can read, the more it can learn about your characters and the way they speak, and it can learn your pacing, and it can learn your word usage and things like that. So um, this week we had someone run a 200,000 word uh, fantasy novel through. Uh, and it did great with that. Um, so I think, yeah, I think the longer the better, but novellas do do fine in it. Um, okay. There's no problem. And I do have, this is a long-term coupon code. I mean, it'll it'll be around for a long time. Draft 2020 will save you 15% if you are interested in running a Marlowe report for yourself. So that's Draft 2020. Draft 2020 will get you a discount on uh, checking that out? Okay. Cool. Thank you. On behalf of draft to digital authors who can who can use this tool to uh, to refine their craft, that is awesome. What a what a special gift for our authors. And the plans are like seventeen dollars a month for two reports a month if you do the annual plan. So it's not it's a great deal either way. Cool, cool. That is awesome. Now we're getting close to the time to start to take questions from the live studio audience. Uh, first question I'm going to pop up, we'll see, is from Charles. Charles asks, is Authors AI for all genres? I love this question. Um, it is for all genres. Oh, I'm sorry, all fiction genres. It is not for nonfiction. It is built for fiction. Um, uh, we are currently in like phase one of Marlowe, but we are going to unveil in the next um, in the next few months is more genre specific comparison. So it will have um, an exact, you know, it, because a romance novel is written different than a suspense novel. So you right. can absolutely run 
your book through right now, no matter what the genre. Um, but in the next few months, an exciting developments will be um, genre specific. So romance, no best selling novels might have a different plot arc than a suspense novel. Cool. That is awesome. And thanks for asking that, Charles. I'm just popping up on the screen draft 2020 in case, uh, in case I was mumbling when I said it, like at the beginning of the interview. <laughs> another, uh, <laughs> uh, another question was, um, uh, where did, uh, where did it go? Where did it go? It was, oh, it was actually, it was a question uh, from Donna. Donna asked uh, probably when we were talking about the movie, was it a side cameo like Hitchcock? Did, was it just your profile or did we, do we get to see you in the scene? It's um, so I'm in. I'm a. There's a couple shots, but it's all tied to the same thing. It's a. It's a side cameo. It'd be easy to miss me, but there's a main character who's um, getting a phone call in the middle of a church service, and I'm his wife, and I'm looking at him and like you know bickering at him. You can't hear me. I didn't have a line. If I had a line, then I could be like SAG eligible. Yeah. Or something. <laughs> so, but I'm like you know giving him the what for, and then he gets up and leaves. And then there's a, another scene where I'm like, um, what, what, like I'm in a crowd, you know? I wasn't doing this, but my stepson was, and we were like, stop, like you're way overacting, you know? He was like, like watching the bus go by, like this was like. <laughs> I always watch buses go by, you know. With the, with the, with the, it must be related to William Shatner when I do stuff like that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Donna asks, uh, it might be a different Donna that asked this question. Uh, how long does it take you to write a book from the first word until you send it out to be published? Um, until I send it out to be published. So I'm going to answer this kind of in a variety of ways. So my first draft normally takes six weeks. Um, my books are normally 60 to 90,000 words. So it takes anywhere from six to eight weeks, depending on the length of the book for a first draft okay. and then I typically budget 30 to 45 days for edits um, so during that I go through I'm a pantser I do not outline so my edits are normally very extensive because I spent the first 15% of the book thinking that I was going to go in this direction and then I took some hard right turn and I have to go back and clean all that up um, so my first drafts are atro atrocious normally um, <laughs> And then, uh, so I spend about 45 days in edits, and I normally do four rounds of rewrites during that time. And then um, and then I start the promo and publishing process. So it depends on how long that promo is, but my, my, everything that's my end of it in terms of writing and rewriting um, normally is like three months. Okay, cool. And and so you said you're pro you're still putting out about two books a year, despite doing all of these other great things for writers. So yeah, cool. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, okay, so next question is coming from Alyssa. Alyssa asks, "Did you see value from hitting the New York Times list? And is is that is that still possible for indies nowadays?" Yeah. So this is a great question. Um, it was interesting to see. I will say this: I hit the New York Times list on my first, the first time I hit the New York Times was I watched sales the following week very carefully because I was very curious to see if I had this giant spike in sales, right? And I did not. I had almost no impact from hitting the New York Times list. But what it did do, granted, that was a few years ago. Now, a lot of times, like I have since noticed that Amazon has like a tab, like the, or, or a lot of retailers, not necessarily Amazon has a tab that says like, the New York Times list, you know, and you can click on it and buy books off that list. Um, there wasn't really any super obvious placement of New York Times list um, when I hit, the different times I hit. I did not see a, a result in sales hardly at all. But long term, it was huge for my career because every time I come on an interview like this, you know, I'm it, it's that title that you carry with yourself forever. It's that title that I plaster on every single book cover and in my, you know, um, email signature and things like that. So it gives you a lot of credibility. Um, and that does, I do believe there is an effect of sales when a reader looks at a book and they say, oh, this person's a New York Times bestseller. It gives them a lot more confidence to buy that book, even if that book has zero reviews and they haven't heard anything for it. Um, is it still possible to hit the list as an indie? When they got rid of the ebook New York Times list, which I guess has been maybe two years now, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, 
at that point in time, I know I was like, okay, I, that's not going to be something I'm going to go after anymore, which was almost good because we were doing these crazy marketing campaigns where everything was so week one focused and our release dates were around it and we were looking at other authors' release dates because everything was about getting one of those 15 slots, right? So it was almost like a weight off our shoulders when I was like, okay, that's just not even a possibility anymore. That being said, indies are still hitting it. They're almost always romance authors that are hitting it. Um, Megan March, who's one of our presenters at Inker's Con, she, and Susan Stoker, who's one of our presenters at Inker's Con, they're one of the only indies I've seen Keenland also hits, um, who are still hitting the New York Times list, but they're doing it with series, they're doing it with really long pre-order windows, and um, and they spent time and built up a development a following. I don't see one hit wonders like we used to do, um, right. and I don't see anyone hitting the New York Times list unless they have an established authorship um, that has grown over time. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Dean comments, and this is kind of true. It's a social proof, right? When you're on the New York Times bestseller list, it means a lot of people must have read it and bought yeah. it. Uh, just, just like seeing a lot of reviews. Yeah. So that is, that's yeah. kind of what you're saying. It's one that a lot of other people made. So I feel confident in making it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Charles asked a follow up and I think we should clarify because he said, so New York Times is not based on sales. Uh, yeah, it is based on sales, but I think Alyssa was saying, it, does it still have an effect uh, on your sales? And I, yeah, and, and I suppose it does. All, it is, New York Times is 100% based on sales. I say 100%. It is curated. <laughs> with curation. Um, yeah, with curation. <laughs> but sales is supposed to be the predominant factor of the New York right. Times. Like, um, where I probably misspoke is it didn't affect my sales after that. Like it, okay. it being listed on, in the paper or online as a New York Times bestseller. Oh, you know what it did affect is my foreign say, my foreign um, deals that I got. So oh, with an agent and stuff like that? With my agent, yeah. So, and you don't have to have an agent. If you don't have an agent, you can reach out to foreign publishers directly. But when you reach out and you say, hey, this book hit the New York Times list, they at least look at it, even if yeah. they weren't. Before, right? Not like, my mom liked it. Yeah, they know what the New York Times list is. Okay, so like everyone knows what that is. So, um, so I definitely on my books that hit the New York Times list, my foreign deals um, are higher on those books than other books. Oh, that's awesome! <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, that's no fantastic. Can can you tell us a little bit more about Anchors Con? Because that's uh, it's coming up. Uh, I was supposed to be there physically, <laughs> I'm getting on a plane and going down there. But I'm going to be actually as soon as we finish this, I'm going to be physically chatting with uh, one of your colleagues and recording a session. Uh, can you talk about what Anchors Con is and and why it's valuable for writers? Absolutely. So Anchors Con is an annual conference. Um, it, last year was its first year in Dallas, Texas. And from the very beginning, it, we actually started it. It was going to be just an online conference. Like um, it was going to be an online conference. And then when it was like we were dealing with, uh, are we going to be able to film in high definition these speakers and not have someone's cat walking by? You know what I mean? Or like someone having issues. And it was like, Oh, and then it moved to, okay, I'm going to fly all the speakers together and we're going to film just for three days, you know, and that will be Ingers Con. And it was like, well, wait a minute, if we have all the authors together and speakers together, like that's not really fair to not allow attendees to be here and experience that with us, right? So then it's suddenly like, okay, we have a conference. Um, so Ingers Con is a little different from other conferences. It's, it's very business focused. So we have four tracks, um, craft, marketing, um, advertising and business. So um, one of my big things, and it really I should have made it a key to success, is to look at your career like a business. Um, so a lot of what we do is um, focus on on running your author career, even if it's part time as a business, um, because that's really going to help you succeed. And we, from the beginning, we had a live conference, and then a month later we released our digital conference, and even. Um, that's because I hate to travel. If I can attend something from home, I will. Um, but we worked in as many interactive elements between uh, attendees as we could. We did that last year. We have round tables, which are like private chats. You can do video chats with other authors on what you need to discuss. You can nominate or you can create your own round table. And this year, um, our retailers like Draft2Digital do an open office hours. So you can talk one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting. 
with those retailers. Um, so it's it's going to be, um, I'm really excited because once we lost the live option this year, it really caused us to just go all in on digital. And you can find out details at inkerscon.com. We also have an aspiring author boot camp. Um, but it caused us to just go all in on digital and go, what can we do this year that we didn't do last year? And how can we make these presentations better? And um, whether it's adding closed captioning or chapters or you know, different things to the video. Um, and it's gonna be really cool. We're gonna do like a sprint, uh, like a four hour sprint session where we do a sprint workshop and then live sprinting together. And um, I'm really excited. We're, we're stretching out the festivities over the first three weeks of June because we just have so much to pack in, but then they'll have access to watch the videos and presentations for, um, for a year. So that is a question. A uh, question that I had about that is: Can people still register for the virtual conference, or is it is is there a cap on it already? No, oh, they can still register for the virtual conference, um, and they can register. So it launches on um, the sixth of June, and um, they can register anytime after that. What they're going to miss out on is office hours and live events, which are the first three weeks of June. Right. But we're helping people right now buy access for the 2019 conference that they want to watch all. Oh, because the they can watch all the videos still. Yeah, because they can watch all the videos. Really, the advertising might be a little outdated, but everything else, you know, is is pretty accurate. Yeah, so you can um, really anytime you can buy access to the 2020 conference and watch, um, just binge away or spread it out, you know, how we like to do it. Oh, I love that. Well, I have to, I have to applaud you guys because when you sent the package for the, the recording that I'm about to do, you sent a, a, a beautiful template, you know, here's, here's the PowerPoint template to, you know, follow this look and feel. So it wasn't all over the map. And then, I mean, I have experience doing video stuff, but I love that. I watched the video where you guys explain how to do this in case you've, because maybe they've presented on stage, but they've never done it to a virtual audience before. And I thought that was really great because, you know, because you're, you're going to get speakers from across the, the board who may be New York Times bestselling authors making seven figures from their income, from their writing, but maybe not necessarily technologically savvy. Uh, and I love how easy you made it for, uh, for, um, participants, I can only imagine how easy you're making it for attendees as well. Well, it's been an interesting, thank you, I appreciate that. It helps that we've done this before, but last year, like when we had the live conference with videographers there, they handled everything, right? So we could record everything from stage so they didn't have to log in. So it's been interesting, like, because some, some things are a two person presentation with a slideshow, some of it's a five person panel, you know, some of it has a moderator, some of it doesn't. So it's like, and then with office hours and vendors, like trying to figure out all the different things. It's been, I love that. Like I love geeking out over ways to figure out things. Um, but it's been a learning process and thankfully it's gone so well. Like our speakers have been rock stars and I don't know if it's because the pressure of knowing that they're going to have to record, but they have been nailing these presentations. Like they've done their research like they like none of this is some halfway thing that they put together, you know, the night before they did it. So that's really I am so pumped for the content that we're that we have this year. Like it's um it's they really took it up a notch and and it's great. Wow, and you haven't even seen my presentation yet. Just wait till I blow your socks off. I expect my socks to be full blown off. Just practice your name. the digital way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what, another question uh, about InkersCon, uh, Charles asks is, is, will it feature agents? Will there be uh, literary agents uh, at that? That's a great question. And to be honest with you, that was one thing like um, four weeks ago, I was like, what if we did pitch sessions with agents? And, and at that point, Teresia, who you're going to be interviewing with, said, stop, okay, because <laughs> Right now, everything's going really great, and we figured out how to. We've set up over 200 mentor appointments with romance authors with a best-selling mentor. Like she's like, at some point, we have to, we have to stop. Like, like, or else it's going to start suffering, you know. And we want to really do a great job with everything. So, um, so to answer your question, Charles, we don't have agents this year, but I, I'm, I'm like, okay, okay, I won't do agents this year. But next year, let's put that on the list, you know. Um, 
Because I do think that's really valuable. Even if you self-publish, talking with an agent, pitching, practicing your pitch and pitching to an agent is um, is really uh, is great prep and is big feedback on your novel. I couldn't agree more. Just being comfortable talking about your book is is valuable for a writer, no matter how you publish. And and that I think the nervousness about pitching, because I've done that myself, that 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 puts you in a completely different tension set that it I think it's good for yeah. you to yeah. learn from. Book differently, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a great exercise to go through, regardless, even if you have no interest in ever traditionally publishing. Well, Alessandra, we are uh, we are out of time, but I wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with uh, with us today, answer some questions, share some amazing insights into your writer life and all the great tools you have for writers. Where can people find out more about you online? Um, AlessandraTorreInc.com is my site for authors. So there's a ton of free resources there. There's information about InkersCon. There's um, videos. It's just, I mean, you can get lost in the site. So. Um, you can check it out, and I've got step-by-step -step courses there as well. And don't forget, Draft 2020 uh, is the code you can use at authors.ai. And you can go there. You can order a report and have it within 15 minutes on your manuscript. So um, so it's instant and unbiased, and, uh, and it's just really cool. It's really cool to look at your book from the viewpoint of Marlo, who has read uh, a ton of bestsellers, but she's also really nice. So don't worry. Like a lot of people are really stressed out about giving their manuscript to to Marlo, and uh, but she's really she's really from their promises. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Absolutely, thank you guys.